Uh, terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Kylie. That's the first time I think, Kylie, you have read since the, uh, in person since the pandemic uh, began. We've seen you on video read the Bible, but it's, I'm sure that was a special thing to come up front and read the Bible like that. Uh, let me add my welcome uh, to James. My name's Lee. I'm the senior pastor of the church. Uh, lovely to welcome you if you're here for the first time, and I would love you to keep your Bibles open. Uh, let's be praying as we begin to uh, listen to God's uh, word expounded, that the Holy Spirit would teach us, that he would illuminate these words, and that we'd see much of the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep your Bibles open, and let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the written word of God. We thank you so much for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to see much of him today. And so help us, Father, to look at him, to gaze at him, as we gaze at these words that you have inspired, and we pray that for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Let me start by asking you a question. How easy do you find it to praise God? Yeah, I suspect most of us, if we're honest, find it easier to do something else. Instead of actively, instead of passionately celebrating all that God has done, our temptation is to do something else, I fear. Our temptation is either maybe to complain to God, to critique God, maybe to question what God is doing. Or even worse, sometimes we just ignore him entirely. Now, let us be crystal clear about this. That sort of way of living is outrageous. It is an outrageous way to live. It is wrong, full stop. However, it is not mysterious why we live like that. It does have an explanation. Why don't we praise God to his face through words, through song, and praise him to other people as we should? Well, normally there are two big reasons. Uh, first, either we don't know something about what God has done in the past, what God is doing now, and what God has prepared in the future. So sometimes it is the case that we just don't know something. We haven't listened or we haven't been taught, and there are things that God has done, is doing, and will do that we just don't know about. And the second big reason is Sometimes we have been told about these things that God is doing, is doing, and will do, but we just forget. And there are different reasons why we forget. Sometimes the busyness of our life. Sometimes we get distracted by worldly affairs, and time takes, and we forget things that we did know, but it's almost as if the truth just leaks out of our heads. Have you ever had those moments where it kind of leaks out? It's like there's a flood coming in, a wonderful truth, and it seems to be leaking at the other end, and you want to kind of stop it, but that's the reality, isn't it? So what's the remedy for our lack of praise to God and about God to other people? Well, we need surely knowledge. We need to open up our Bibles. We need to be attentive. We have to listen to what God reveals about his activities in the world, in our lives. And when we have the true knowledge of Scripture, our minds are conformed again to the truth, and we have more and more reasons to praise God. So that's one thing we have to know, but also we have to be refreshed. There are things that we know that we forget, and we have to come again and to allow God to refresh our understanding. So there are four things I want to say today, four reasons to praise God, or if I can put it like four praise reasons that are emerged from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, this little section. I don't think it's hard to see that praise should be our response to what is written in this section of the Bible. Do you see what is written in verse 3? Straight away, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just love the way he begins this little section. Uh, Peter is about to outline some really big Bible truths. But none of this for Peter is some dry academic exercise. Okay, the concepts, the categories, they're already bubbling in his mind. He, he's aware of what he's about to write about God, about God's involvement in our lives. But before he even writes about them, what is the first thing that he does? He just bubbles forth in praise. This is not going to be some dry theological tome. 
before he even writes the reasons, he bursts out and says, praise be to God. And so before we even hear what he's about to write, we should be aware of our response. What Peter writes should cause us to praise. Now, what are the reasons uh, that are given here to praise our God? Well, first of all, we're told that God has given us new birth. Uh, Listen to how verse 3 uh, continues. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Now, at some point in your life, you may, um, if you are a Christian, be asked a rather strange question. The rather strange question is this. Are you a born-again Christian? And maybe you've had that from friends or family. It often gets asked in a certain tone, a kind of fearful tone. Are you one of those lot? Now, the person normally wants to find out if you're one of those extreme Christians. You know, they're kind of Christians that actually believe something. (laughs) Or maybe uh, they want to know if you're one of those happy, clappy Christians. Because, of course, being happy is a very bad thing. (laughs) The question, of course, is a strange one because it implies that a born-again Christian is one type of Christian as if there are any others. However, this verse uh, reminds us, doesn't it, that every single Christian, every single follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, every single disciple that is genuine is a born-again Christian. It is another way of talking about the new birth, that there is this radical intervention of God in our lives. You cannot be a Christian without experiencing the new birth. Let us appreciate just how radical this is. Being a Christian is not an ordinary thing. It is not like remaining fundamentally the same as you were before you followed Jesus Christ. But what you then do is you add a few rules, maybe a few rituals, but there's not been some dramatic fundamental change. It's just a rather ordinary addition to our normal lives. No, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is someone who has experienced a powerful intervention of God the Holy Spirit to bring about our radical spiritual birth. Now, our church here would love to see a dramatic increase in the number of Christians in our town. Wouldn't you? Even if you're visiting us, I'm sure you would love this for our town and our area. But do you appreciate what needs to happen in order for that vision to become a reality? What are, we, what are we talking about? We are asking God to do loads of spiritual miracles in the dead hearts of countless sinners across our region. Do you get what we're asking God to do? We're not just saying, I hope a few more people would really like the Bible and maybe add to that some moral principles. No, we're asking God to fundamentally intervene dramatically by his spirit in the hearts of countless people and bring life where there is death. It's a pretty radical vision, isn't it? But here's the encouragement. God has done this and is doing this many times. He has done it before. He's doing it now around the world. There will be thousands of people today for the very first time in their life. Today, will experience the new birth for the first time. Isn't that incredible? The question is, do you believe he'll do it here? Well, just for your encouragement, just look around you. You can do it now without face masks on. You can see the the pretty faces. You can see the ugly faces. You can see the faces smiling. But do you understand something? The people who are here today who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are evidence of God's powerful work already. Peter says, God in his great mercy. Isn't that a lovely phrase? God in his great mercy, not even in his small mercy, but God in his great mercy has given his new birth. We've got to understand that this is not something we deserved. And it's not something small, it is something generous from a great providing God who intervenes and brings us life. And this, when we understand that it is God's great mercy that has given us this new life, that, you see how it should make us praise God. But we won't praise God for it either if we don't think God has done this great thing, or if we don't think it is a great thing. 
if we think we are fundamentally the reason why we are Christians, then we might as well praise ourselves. Have a praise session in your house where you put a picture of you up and you sing songs to you. But it's odd, isn't it? I hope. (laughs) But in order to see the intensity of the praise that we need to project to our God, we have to understand how big a thing it is that God has done. It's a difference, isn't it, between if you were maybe um, traveling in a car with somebody and they offer you a, a, a mint, a smint or something like that, okay? You might say, thank you very, very much. You might be thinking, maybe I do have some really bad breath and I should invest in my own. But if someone offers you a mint, you're thankful. But you don't spend the rest of your decade going around praising that person for this wonderful gift of a mint do you? But imagine you're stuck around the world in some horrific place of captivity and where you cannot escape and someone managed to orchestrate a whole rescue operation that rescues you and takes you out of that horrible condition and brings you into freedom and joy. I bet you for the rest of your life you're going, I want to thank you. I want to praise you. I want to tell people about you because you have done a great thing. Do you see what this is? We've got to understand that God has done it. He has brought new birth. But we've also got to understand that the enormity of this is that God has brought life where there was death. Now, you might be thinking today, well, how do I know if I'm born again? How do I know if I'm spiritually alive? Let me ask you a slightly different question. How do you know you are alive? I'm not a philosophical debate now. But I suspect if I say to you, do you know that you are alive now? Most of you, I think, maybe all of you are going to say yes. What you don't have to do is you don't have to think about maybe I'll go and find my birth certificates that that will prove I'm alive. Or maybe I'll get some witnesses who were there at my birth. No, you know you're alive. There are, there are certain signs of being alive that you are aware of. Do you understand? How do you know you are spiritually alive? How do you know you are born again? The Bible gives us things to look out for. Do you actually love the Scriptures? Do you love listening to the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you look to the cross of Christ as your salvation? There's all sorts of evidences that you are alive. Now, if you don't experience any of that, and all you have is a vague belief in some general God, you're probably not spiritually alive. But if you love Jesus and cling to him, brothers and sisters, praise God that you are alive. That's the first reason. Second reason that we should praise God to him in that direction and about him to other people is that God has given us a living hope. Do you see that? How verse 3 continues, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We know this, but it's worth repeating all the time, I think, that Bible hope, when the Bible uses the word hope, it is different from how we normally use the word hope hope. It's worth saying it. So this week, I know a number of us were at the open air theater uh, for different concerts. We're enjoying that sense of normality. But often if someone goes to the open air theater, you, you may hear a phrase like this, we hope there isn't any rain. <laughs> but we all know <laughs> that reality is there pretty much will be, and therefore people take raincoats and mats and everything else, because your expectation is that at some point there will be a downpour. We hope there isn't any rain. We, we hope it might work out like that. But that's not Bible hope. When the Bible says hope, it means absolute certainty, absolute confidence that this will happen in the future. The only thing is that it isn't the future yet. But there's no uncertainty. Bible hope is certain. So you should be encouraged by that anyway. If it simply said that we have been given new birth into hope, we should praise God. But do you see, it's not just hope. It's living hope. Now, that is an intriguing phrase. And when I was going through the preparation for this, the number of commentaries that I looked at that just don't even talk about it. (laughs) They just kind of skirt over this little phrase and they accelerate into the other things. But living hope is a fascinating thing. What could it mean to have new birth into a living hope? Well, there are different things it could mean. It could mean that we have a sure, certain confidence in the future that changes lives. 
So it changes our lives, living hope. Of course, the Bible does say that, doesn't it? The truths of the Bible do make an active difference in our lives. That's true. It could mean that we have a hope that means that we will be alive forever. And of course, that is true, isn't it? You, you want a hope about that. Some people are hoping that we will save the planet for the generations to come, aren't they? And they're doing all they can to change their lifestyle, recycling every day, so that they hope that in some future generation, we'll have a planet they can survive in. The reality, however, is that they won't be there to see it. You might say that's a dead hope. So living hope could be, yes, we have a, a vision of the future where we will be there to experience. And of course, the Bible does say that. However, I just wonder if it's slightly different. I wonder if this is a vision and a focus on a person. Jesus, our living hope. Let me just read you something. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter. We're told, chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. I just think it's fascinating, isn't it, that in chapter 2, when we're speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he is referred to as what? The living stone. Peter loves talking about this living language. And so what happens is we have a living hope. It fits, doesn't it, with the resurrection from the dead. We actually have our whole future confidence is all about a person. It's all about Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. And when we are given new birth, what happens next is we have desires to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we cling to him, we are united to him as our living hope. It's him. And we praise God that our new birth unites us to Jesus, and therefore all our security is all on him. You have a real relationship, not with a proposition, but with a person, Jesus, and we relate to him. Uh, Dear friends, let us praise God for our living hope. What else? Third, God has prepared an inheritance for us. Verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We know that inheritance, it's family language. It's the language of children and parents, isn't it? And it therefore should be no surprise to us that those who experience the new birth receive an inheritance because you're born into a family. We're born into the Father's family, and therefore, it should not surprise us that the Father is preparing an inheritance for us. Now, normal human inheritances, they vary, don't they, in value and in significance. But even the best and even the richest inheritances, well, they can degrade. If you've got a very rich person who's got an expensive wine collection, for example, and they're storing it for you, and it's worth loads, and it's going to taste wonderful, the reality could be that when you actually crack open your first bottle when your relative dies and you get all the wine, it might have turned into vinegar. Wouldn't that be a disaster? Maybe some rich relative has got some original masterpiece painted by a wonderful painter, but by the time you get it, they've stored it next to the, the window, and by the time you've got it, the sun has just destroyed the painting, and it's just different shades of different black and gray colors. Even the best inheritors in the human realm, they fade, they perish, they demise. But God's inheritance for us, his children, how is that described? It will never perish. It will never spoil. It will never fade. And this is kept in heaven for us. Now, normally, when do we get an inheritance? We get an inheritance when somebody else dies. Yes? But this is different. (laughs) We get our Christian inheritance when we die. (laughs) Christ has died for us to pay the way for it, but we enter into our inheritance when we die. Die. Now, I don't know if you ever think about earthly inheritances. I'm not sure you're allowed to do that, or at least admit you're, allowed, you're doing that, are you? Because basically it means you're thinking about what relative will die and which one will leave you the most. It's probably not the right thing to be talking about this publicly, is it? Particularly if my mother is listening, so we love you very much. I'm not, th- I'm not thinking about that, but let us be... Um, I don't know what expectations you have. I really don't have expectations of 
what is to come in your life, what inheritances will happen. But let's get this crystal clear. What God has prepared for us in the future as his children is mind-blowing. It's exciting, it will never disappoint, and it will always be there for us. So lift your eyes, brothers and sisters, to the inheritance that is to come, and praise God for it. And fourth, God, we're told, is keeping us safe for this inheritance. Isn't it wonderful? There's no point having an inheritance that is preserved perfectly for us if the inheritors aren't around to enjoy it. But what we're told now, the promise of verse 5, is that God will keep the inheritors safe. Listen to this, verse 5. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We're told that God will shield us by his power. And we've already heard this morning in our service that God has all power. So that's pretty good that it's God all powerful God shielding us by his power. But what does that mean? Should we expect as Christians a pain free life full of comfort? Is that how God protects us by his power? Is that what it means for God to use his power as we wait for heaven as we journey home? No. Listen to verse 6. In all this, you greatly rejoice. You see, not only are these reasons, reasons to praise, but they are reasons for joy. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while. Our earthly life is a little while in comparison to the eternity to come. What's the little while? What's our experience? A little while. Well, you may, you may, not guaranteed, but you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The promise for God to get us to heaven as the inheritors. Well, the arena of our joy is the arena of testing. In the little while, God may, God may allow all sorts of trials. Notice it's this kind of multicolored trials, not just one thing, but a whole range of circumstances in our life that can come upon us at any time that is a trial for us. Sometimes it can be the career that looks so certain that is pulled away from you. Sometimes it's the health that you thought was the most important thing in your life that you had. And then suddenly you have the scan and the doctor says, no, you've got to come in. I've got to tell you the results in person. And it aches. Maybe it's the family situation where you just thought this is perfect, but then the family seems to be getting destroyed. Whatever it might be, there are all sorts of trials in this little while. On the journey home, God promises to protect our faith, but he protects it in the arena of testing. Now, you might ask, why? Why permit the trials to come? It's not that if God doesn't have um, power to stop stuff, he is all-powerful. So why does he permit the trials to come on our journey home? Well, look at verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's where we're going. That's home. That's the salvation of our souls. But the little while now, God will permit all sorts of trials. Why? It is actually one of the ways that God uses to get us home. Trials bring grief. The Bible's not ignorant, it's not stupid. The Bible is is realistic that many of the trials will bring us grief, agony, heartache. But God uses them to stop us, if I can put it like this, pitching our tent short of heaven. (laughs) Through them, the trials that come our way, we learn to trust in our God more. We learn to have our hearts stirred for the future. We learn that this place that we inhabit now is not our home, that all the potential comforts and things that we could pursue, that is not the end of the story. So we don't pitch our tent. We don't make our home here. 
The trials come in all sorts of forms, and if they come, our challenge is to respond in faith and hope. But we have the promise from here that God will protect our faith so that we arrive home. God often uses trials, brothers and sisters, in order to make our touch on this world lighter and to raise our vision to heaven. God will get you home, and that is a reason to praise God. So don't be discouraged this morning if I end like this and say to you, do not be discouraged if you are not praising God as you should. This is not a, a sermon to, to make you feel guilty that none of us are praising God as we should. Now, the very fact that these truths are written down in 1 Peter is a sign that the early Christians struggled with the same response. If they never struggled with praising God, why would you even have to write it? But the reality is there's often a disconnect between our desire to praise God and the reality of what we actually do, but these reasons that are written down are designed by God to elevate our praise. So go into the week. Go into the week praising God in your heart. Go into the week singing to the Lord on your own. Go into the week and we gather again to praise God together and speak about God and praise Him to other people, and there are reasons to do it. New birth, hallelujah. Living hope. Praise the Lord. He has prepared an inheritance for us that is truly mind-blowing. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he will get us there because he will keep us safe on the journey. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures that reveal the truth. And thank you, Father, for what you have reminded us of today, or even taught us for the very first time. Help us to be a people who journey together as a people of praise for the glory of Christ. Amen.